those of you that are already in, I see more people are arriving. My name is Miriam Phillips. I'm the pastor of Vision and Next Steps here at Crossroads, and we're glad each of you are here, especially glad to see children joining us today, most of them heading upstairs. We're glad to see faces we haven't seen in a while, see a number of people I've never met before, and this is a wonderful opportunity to say when we gather together, we are actually part of one family, one community, whether we've met each other yet or not, it's just the opportunity to connect with each other. Welcome to those who are joining on Zoom. I know a number of you have uh, texted me and said, uh, you thought I was gonna be there, but we tested positive today. We're not joining today, but we're so glad we actually have the opportunity to join digitally as well as in person. We're gonna be building up bit by bit in the weeks to come. So today we're able to add kids programs and next week we're going to be able to offer hospitality and coffee and baked goods of course you see back there there's posters back there we do need some sign-ups for people to help bake and serve coffee and that kind of thing but um, well our community is is good at rising to the occasion to do these things together also the youth activities start this week. I tell you that the thing they're going to do on Friday night is one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time, right? Right, to you. It's, uh, anyway, it's all on the website. You can check it out. But if, if you have um, teens at your house or know somebody who would enjoy it, please do, uh, do join, and, and they'll be starting their youth uh, Sunday mornings as well every other week. So bit by bit, here we go. We are aware, though, for some of you, and I'm probably talking primarily to people at home. There's some of you who are have uh, health problems that make actually this time of opening up and less distancing, less masking, a little scarier and more vulnerable rather than, oh, this is great, the society's opening up. So we will continue to create spaces here in real life where there is an opportunity to sit a little bit further apart and we won't look at you funny if you need to mask uh, because we want everyone to be included in our community. Today, you'll see food coming around and maybe some extra people coming in even after the service. Today starts Alpha. We've waited a long time and we're really thrilled to be able to do Alpha in real life. And um, it'll be starting about 12.30, so in a, in a little while, um, we'll be doing that, but we do want to be in a few moments to pray for the Alpha team and for the people joining Alpha. Um, a little later on, you're going to see, um, at talking at the, with the elder board, we've kind of lost the rhythm of expressly, explicitly giving our gifts to God together in the service. Now, most of you who give regularly at Crossroads you know, give through the bank, and that's great, but actually it's good to have a moment to stand, to stand still and say, okay, what I did give, I'm giving as an act of worship, not just uh, paying my bills or paying my dues to the, to the organization I'm with. And we'll take a moment to do that later. If you haven't figured out giving at Crossroads, it's a little tricky. Together with the song lyrics, there's a QR code that gets you there, or your registration gets you to the song lyrics. But at the bottom of the song lyrics... Um, document, there's a place for giving, also in the church app if you have that, so uh, a tiki says Bob. So in just a moment we're going to pray for community needs, we're going to pray for, for the Alpha, Alpha team, and I'm going to invite Bob, also part of the prayer team. Bob is kind of, uh, we laugh, we say Bob's, this is my husband by the way, Bob's, uh, Bob's like the Swiss Army knife of of, uh, of Crossroads. Anything that needs to be done, he has a little little uh, attachment on his uh, on his, his tool to be able to do it. So he is part of the prayer team, and I've asked him to pray together for us. Um, Alpha team, are there Alpha team people here? Yeah, those of you who are here already, would you just stand? And uh, Bob's going to start out praying for you guys. And for Alpha, and if you want to sit down after a while, you can. But um, Bob, would yeah. you pray for us? Let's, let's pray together. 
Lord Jesus, you invited us to ask you, and, uh, and so we do. We ask your help that we don't just do this in our own strength, that, that we would somehow um, bless uh, this effort uh, to invite people to come and talk about uh, the meaning of life and the meaning of Jesus uh, all these centuries later for our time, for our world, for our hearts. And so we ask your blessing on the team and our work together, on the participants who come and on the weeks ahead as we study together and, and talk honestly. Would you uh, just keep it safe and, and make it real and, and beyond anything that is in our ability? In a sense, this church started in Alpha Course 25 years ago, and we ask you to bless the whole church, the life of the church, in, with that same protection and guidance. And so uh, we lift these things up to you. For those who are sick, we pray for your comfort and your healing. Uh, for the wide world around us, for the wars and rumors of wars, and for the situation uh, right now in, in Ukraine and, and between Ukraine and Russia and, 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 and the wide world. Lord, um, we ask you to raise up uh, spirit-led peacemakers to intervene and turn, turn the tide from evil to good uh, and from, uh, from hatred to uh, forgiveness and, and, and new creativity. So we, we pray for our wide world, for um, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, this and all, and all, all so much more, uh, we pray in Jesus' name. And Father, we think of the abundance you've provided for us. We're grateful for how you've provided for us, that we're able to buy the things that are really needed and take care of our, ourselves, our families, and we recognize that every good thing comes from you. And for every gift that we're giving today and every gift that we've given this last period of time, we want to say this isn't just a... Um, paying a dues, but we are giving back to you in thankfulness and gratitude, and we do give it explicitly to you. Let's just take a moment to say your own prayers to God, your own prayer of surrender to God. Father, thank you for your beautiful, multicultural, intergenerational family gathering together today in so many countries. Revive and sanctify us, I pray. Make us a house of prayer for all nations and set our hearts to live again, to be on fire again with the good news of your gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we sing together. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. Yeah, feel free to stand and lift your heart to God. Oh God, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes will
Good morning, Crossroads. Good morning for those of you who are here. Good morning you for those of you who are watching us on Zoom. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship, for singing songs of praise and of encouragement over our lives all the way up to the heavens. My name is Sossi Bene. I'm a member of the teaching team. And it is my pleasure this morning to come and to read the Word of God and also to speak on the Word of God. We have praised God. We have entered into His presence with our prayers. We have opened our lives to Him. And this is the moment in our worship service when we actually quiet our hearts and our minds and we are ready to receive the Word of God, in, uh, to receive God Himself. Um, now here at Crossroads, we are in a series that um, we are kind of thinking and speaking and reading through. And the series has to do with the kingdom of God. It has to do with the reality that it is God who ultimately rules this world. And by God ruling this world, by God ruling our lives and ruling our reality, it has... Uh, that, that there's, it has a, a certain mode to it. It has a certain flavor to it. it. It has a certain taste to it. And Sunday by Sunday, we are tasting how good the kingdom of God is. Now, last week, we started with uh, the parables, and the parables are specifically that relate to judgment. Now, I know that for us as modern people, the word judgment is something that we really do not like because theologically or in our minds we think about God as being just a nice guy. Just as nice as we are, maybe he's more perfect in his niceness, but God forbid that God would actually have an opinion on the world that we live in. And that's exactly what confronts us in these parables. That besides of how we see the world, God also sees the world in a very specific way. And that might not agree with our ideas of how the world is, how people are in it, and how our lives are in it. So today we're going to be looking at that specifically. We're going to be reading a passage, a well-known passage uh, from the scriptures. It is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And one of the things that in Christian tradition is that this passage has been usually read in the context of how real hell is. And for today, I just want to ask you to somehow take that thought and park it somewhere else and try to listen to this story this morning afresh. Because I think it has much more to say. It has much more to offer to us than simply a way of explaining what hell is and how hell is. Yeah, so park that idea, put it away, and listen to it afresh. Listen to it all over again, and maybe we will discover something new together. There's not much new that is happening in the Christian faith Everything we have is what we have received, and what we have received we also pass on. So I'm not busy giving you something excitingly new, but something that is part of our Christian tradition. So I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, which is the third book of the New Testament. And I'm going to be reading from chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. And that's where the story of the rich man and Lazarus is found. But before I read, let me just say a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we are gathered here, as we open our hearts and our minds, as we quiet our lives, we pray but that by your word and also by your spirit, that you come and that you speak to us, that you address us, that uh, we might be able not only to have ears, but also hear, not only have eyes, but also see. So we ask you, Father, to have mercy on us. In your name we pray. Amen. So this is how the story goes. 
Now there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip, to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Just before um, Jesus tells this parable, just before Jesus um, comes to speak about the story of the rich man and Lazarus, what we read um, in verse uh, 14 is that the Pharisees were lovers of money and heard all these things that Jesus was preaching about, and they ridiculed him. So it's interesting that Jesus is the kind of figure that when people meet him, they either worship him or ridicule him. Anyway, so it comes after this ridicule, the story of rich man and Lazarus. Now, the first thing this story does to us is actually confirms the way the world is. Right? All of us live in this world, and we look out, and we can observe what is really going on. And that's what the story is on a face value. And the story tells us that when you look at the world and when you look at the people that inhabit this world, what you see is that there are people who are rich and there are people who are poor. And rich people have all the good clothes. The rich people have food in abundance. Rich people can afford to party every single day. And within their gaze, it says, there are the poor people. Because poor people are never out of sight. Poor people are never so far away as for us not to see them. And there at the gate of this rich man, there is a poor man, and all he has is his name. And he is a poor man, not a poor woman or widow. He is a man. He lives a less than optimal life. He is hungry and hoping to be fed by what is left over. Not only that, he is also sick. His body is covered with sores. And maybe the ultimate humiliation is that the dogs come around and lick his sores. 
See, poverty somehow makes people lose their humanity. So as we read this story, we are confronted with our own perception of the world. We are confronted with the world as is. There are those who have and there are those who have nothing. And we also qualify the world and we say that the rich and those who have are the ones who are blessed. And the ones who have nothing, like Lazarus, they are the ones who are therefore cursed. The ones who are rich and have everything, they have worked hard. They, are, they have earned their position in life. They are successful. Therefore, they must be blessed. And poverty, we usually say that because we live in the age of choice, we say that people are poor because they choose to stay poor. People are poor because they don't want to get rich and blessed. It is fundamentally their fault. So we read this story and if we allow the story to read us also, then we realize that this is how the world goes around. And then the great equalizer. That himself, death himself, comes and visits both the rich and the poor. One is taken by angels and the other one is dead and buried. And both awake on the other side of death. And this is the second, this is the second kind of step that we are taking in this story. It becomes clear how the world is when God actually judges the world. Now we are confronted with the reality that. This is how God sees the world. There's one way that we see it, and there's also a way that God sees it and also judges the world. And what is interesting is that the poor man, Lazarus, is taken by angels to the bosom of Abraham. Now that, that's an image of an afterlife where the poor are comforted. And the rich man wakes up in Hades and he knows that feeling that he knew all his life. He knows that hunger that he has. He knows that thirst that he has, that he has gotten used to in his life every single time being able to fulfill it, to fulfill all his thirst, to fulfill all his appetites. The difference is that now in Hades, all he has left is his insatiable appetite and thirst. While he was living, Lazarus was his neighbor. Lazarus was inside. They were very close to each other. And now in Hades, the poor are far away. There is a chasm that cannot be crossed, not from this side there, not from that side back. And he sees that the poor Lazarus is comforted. And he wants a resolution because he is rich after all, so he is used to satisfying all his appetites, and it becomes obvious that in this place it is not possible. And the rich man then thinks, you know, life is not all about me. I have also brothers, so please send somebody back from the dead because I have five brothers, 
they are on the same life trajectory as I was on, and I'm afraid that they're going to land here. And then it is said that they have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. They have the Bible. They have the law and the prophets. There are enough stories. There is enough to be known about the kingdom of God. Let them listen to that. Because even if a man goes back from the dead, even if a man resurrects and goes back, they will not listen. It would be a futile exercise to send somebody back in order to wound them. What we are confronted with is that in the judgment of God. The world is turned upside down. The world becomes a very different proposition. Because in the kingdom of God, those who have none are comforted. And those who have everything are tormented. God in his judgment God in his kingdom takes care of those who have absolutely nothing. Those who have lost in this life. Those who did not make it in this life. So where does all of this leave us? What does it all mean? Am I saying that having is bad and therefore we should have nothing? Am I saying that just by the fact that we live in the rich West that we are condemned in the kingdom of God? I think this, this passage actually challenges our worldview. It challenges our paradigms within which we decide who are the people who are successful and blessed and who are the people who are poor and lost in this life. So it challenges our worldview. But it can also become something very self-reflexive. Self-reflective also. I think it challenges us to ask the question, what does my own richness have to do with the poverty that is in front of my eyes? What does the blessing, what does the success, what does my money, what does everything I have in this life have to do with the poverty that is in this country, in this city, in my neighborhood, even in my family? You see, poverty was in the gaze of the rich man. And poverty is also not far from us. The challenge is, is whether we see it. And not, not, not only that we see it, but whether we are able to think through what it is that we actually have in this world. You see, I think fundamentally is not so much that we have an optical problem, that we don't see things the right way. Scripture says that faith comes by hearing. That actually that what we hear should change the way we look at the world. And that is twice the solution that is given in this passage. Let them listen to Moses and to the prophets because then they will see the world the right way. And I think that is the challenge in front of us. The challenge in front of us whether we are able to hear what it is that Moses and the prophets are telling us. And even more than that, 
What is that one person who came back from the death is telling us? You see, the, the Gospels have been written after the resurrection of Jesus. The early church, while they were thinking through and remembering the stories and the sermons and the life of Jesus, they already had first-hand experience that even if somebody comes back from the death, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that people will do the right thing. And yet, this morning we are challenged to listen. To listen to Moses. To listen to the prophets. To listen to Jesus himself. To listen to the scriptures. And for once, not only have ears, but also hear. And then maybe, as we hear and as we listen, then maybe it changes as we see the world around us. Then maybe we will learn how to look at our own blessedness, our own success in this life. How to truly qualify that which we have. And maybe... And just maybe it allows us to actually see the Lazarus that is always within gaze. That is always there in our lives. It might be a neighbor, it might be a family member, it might be a friend, it might be a colleague, it might be somebody in the neighborhood, it might be somebody in the city, it might be somebody in this country. But maybe our life and our sight and our vision changes when we truly listen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we hear your word, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you change our vision. that you change the way we look at the world and the way we look at others and the way we look at even our own lives. Father, speak to us. Allow us to hear your word anew in our lives. In the name of your incarnate word, our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please stand as we continue to respond in worship.
Please remain standing as I pronounce the blessing. Now, I don't know about you, but I, most of the times when I look, I have this tendency to deceive myself. My vision is not perfect. It doesn't see everything. And usually when I look, I think that everybody else is doing much better than I am doing. That somehow I am on the losing side of, of this life. And when I was saying that to a friend of mine, it just reminded me this week, but Saucy, have you listened to your belovedness? Have you put your ears close to the chest of Abraham to hear that you are actually beloved? Because hearing that I am beloved, I know that usually my eyes tend to change. So in this blessing that I pray, I pray that may you hear the voice of the Father, the gentle heart beating of the Son and the ever-changing wind of His presence that says that you are a beloved child of God. And may that change the way you see yourself, the way you see the world, the way you see your neighbors, the way you see your family, the way you see everything in this world. Amen. We say that we're a next step community. Every time our most important next step is making space in our lives and our hearts for God, okay? So when we give next steps, it's not just all activism. We hope that you'll do that today. There'll be people over here at, by the window to pray with you if you're saying, Wow, this next step of making room in my heart, listening to that thirst that we have. That, well, it's time to, to do something about it. Please come for prayer. We do hope that we'll make a community, a next step community, where we can really make time for important conversations. All those sign-up sheets over there, if you say, my next step is helping to make this community a welcoming space for the next one, we hope that you'll do that. Now, there's a lot of new people here today, and if you're new, you don't realize maybe the next person is also new. <laughs> so we hope that you'll all be the welcome team and say hello to the person next to you. Say, hey, what brings you here? Where do you come from? And make this a crossroads welcome. And next week, it'll be welcome with coffee and tea and baked goods. So we're, we're making, making uh, steps forward. Have a wonderful day. God bless you each.